Kevin Raposo here with speedyphotographer.com and in this video I'll be sharing six actionable steps that you can take to start up a photography business. I was actually reluctant to create this video in the first place because I know it's been done a million times and I didn't want to just add another one to the list. So I'm going to try and be as specific as possible with my suggestions and recommendations throughout this tutorial. And if you're looking for something specific, all of the concepts and times I'm about to reference are up on screen. So the very first step if you're starting with a completely blank slate is to identify your niche. This is easily the biggest mistake that I see new photographers making, and it's also something that I did wrong for a very long time. I spent several years shooting everything to try and figure out what it was that I actually cared about. And if you're doing that for a couple of months to see what it is you'd like to specialize in, that's completely fine. But trying to be a jack of all trades and shoot everything from weddings to automotive to sports to real estate to concerts will not help you to build a consistent roster of clients that you can rely on for your work. This mistake stems from the fear that if you say no to an opportunity, then you've missed a chance to grow your photography business, but the exact opposite is true. If you identify exactly what you want to specialize in and then tailor everything else in your business around it, you're more likely to appeal to potential clients. I've literally been asked dozens of times, do you shoot weddings? Do you shoot weddings? And I have turned away every single job because that is not an area of photography that I specialize in. But doing this allows me to target my sports and real estate clients more effectively because when they go to my website, they see very specific types of work. So sit down and think carefully about where you're your passions lie and what it is you want to shoot and then stick with it and move on to the next step. So the second step is to register your business and set up the framework. If photography is actually something that you want to do with your life, even if you choose to do it only as a side hustle, you should invest the time in properly registering your business. This includes deciding whether you want to be a sole proprietor or an incorporated business, getting a tax number, finding commercial liability insurance, setting up a client management system with accounting, contracts, invoice templates. Full disclaimer here, I'm not a legal professional or an accountant and this is advice is going to be drastically different from one country to the next. But the basic principles are the same. You want the government to recognize your business so that you can charge sales tax, pay income tax, and then write off your expenses. Now, a lot of new photographers push back on this part, thinking, I don't want to pay income tax on this small amount of money, or I can set it all up once I start making money. And my response to that is simple. How do you know when you're going to start making money? A lot of photographers give up quickly, not because they can't land new clients, but because they started as a side hustle and then they have no pressure to succeed. But if you treat your photography like a business from the very beginning, the government is eventually going to expect you to turn a profit. It's that or you're going to be audited by your local tax agency for writing off that $10,000 camera without having any kind of income. I honestly believe that type of pressure is what will push you to succeed if you're doing this as a side hustle. With that out of the way, we can move on to the third step, which is to identify your ecosystem. Now, what do I mean by ecosystem? Well, a lot of new photographers will concentrate on the specific camera they want to buy thinking, oh, I want the Canon R5 or a Nikon Z7 II or whatever it might be. I received dozens of messages asking me, what camera do you use? Or do you think this camera brand is good? And sure, I can tell you that I use the Canon R6 and that I'm shooting this video on a Sony a6500. But what does that actually mean? Nothing, because your goals and your interests with photography might be different than mine. Not only that, but your camera is only one part of the equation. You also need to consider the lenses, the lighting equipment, the studio gear, and all of the accessories that you're going to buy with it, along with the price of those things. And this is referred to as the camera's ecosystem. My number one recommendation for you here is to start by looking at lenses, not cameras. If you actually spent time on step one and you seriously identified your photography niche and it becomes easier to figure out which lenses you need now and in the future. Let's say my dream is to be a National Geographic photographer shooting wildlife. Someday I know I want to buy a 200 to 400 millimeter f4 lens. So that leaves me with two choices already, Canon or Nikon, because no other camera manufacturer offers one of these specialty lenses. My point here is that no matter which niche you're interested in, there will be significant differences in lens options from one camera manufacturer to the next. Moving on now, the fourth step is to launch your website. There are a number of great tools out there you can use to set this up, including Squarespace, the all-in-one solution for anybody. Just kidding, there's no sponsorship here. Squarespace is an option, but I also see photographers using Wix, Format, Adobe Portfolio, and a number of other alternatives. But no matter what you choose, I recommend designing your portfolio around four key principles. It should establish you as an authority, it should show off your best work, it should build a relationship with your customer and it should encourage people to take action. So let me really quickly break down all four of those concepts. First, establishing authority involves positioning yourself and your work in a way that leads people to conclude that you are an expert. This can be one of the hardest things to accomplish because there is no one thing that establishes authority. You need to build it up through a combination of many small triggers. Second, showing off your best work is pretty self-explanatory. Make sure your portfolio is kept up to date and include only the absolute best work you have. Third, building a relationship with your customer 
customer is an important part of any photography website, especially when you work in a more personalized niche like maybe family portraits, for example. The language and the wording that you choose plays a huge part in this. Fourth and finally, encouraging people to take action involves the use of cues, links, and prompts throughout your website, reminding the viewer what they need to do. And in marketing, this is also referred to as a call to action. I spend well over half an hour inside my course discussing how I design my website to consistently apply these four concepts, as well as the SEO and marketing strategies that help me to land on the first page of Google search results. With those four steps out of the way, we move on to the fifth step, which is to identify a pricing framework. Now, I am a huge advocate of starting your photography business while working a day job. A lot of people think you need to take this huge leap of faith and just drop everything to try and become a photographer. Or worse, they think that the only way they'll ever be considered successful is if they do it full time. I know many great photographers who also stick with their day job because there just isn't enough work to go around or they don't specialize in a lucrative industry. Now, some of you will be thinking, didn't you just say in step two that pressure helps you to succeed? Sure I did, but the problem with just dropping everything and going full time into photography is that it becomes more difficult to start out by charging higher rates. You need to work a lot more badly now because you have no other supplementary sources of income, so you become more willing to compromise instead of just saying no to cheap labor. And when it comes to pricing, it can be very hard to pull yourself out when you're stuck with a bunch of cheap clients or you're known as the cheap photographer in your area. So my suggestion is hold on to your day job and then figure out what other similar photographers with similar experience levels are charging in your area. Once you land on an appropriate rate, stick with that rate and don't budge. Unless you didn't do your research properly or you've misjudged your target audience, you're more than likely to find someone who's going to give you a chance and then you can keep building from there. And speaking of building, this leads perfectly into step number six, which is to identify a plan for scaling your business. Now, there are many different ways to scale your photography business. You can cold call to potential clients. You can get referred by others, boosting your online presence. The list goes on. But all of those things are external factors. They require somebody else to take action on your behalf. And when you're first starting out, you have almost no control over somebody else deciding to recommend you other than just asking them to. So in addition to those things I mentioned, I also suggest that you focus on two internal factors which you can control, which are diversification and outsourcing. When I say diversification, I mean that you should be willing to take on different types of work within your niche. This might come as a surprise, but most photographers are not just doing photography. They're running YouTube channels, they're writing books, they're working on video projects as well, they're working a day job. And understanding that this is a more common reality than making $500,000 a year shooting whatever you want one day a week will help to keep you motivated and grounded while you're scaling the business. On the other hand, when I say outsourcing, I mean that you should be willing to pay others to do work that will allow you to focus on the high value activities within your business. In the book, Exponential Organizations, author Salim Ismail points out that having staff on demand is a necessary characteristic for speed, functionality, and flexibility in a fast changing world. Leveraging personnel outside the base organization is key to creating and running a successful organization. In other words, outsourcing doesn't just save you time. It also enables you to access more talented content creators who specialize in other aspects of photography. Now, content creators hate outsourcing, including me, because it means a lack of control over the final product and your final vision. But instead of thinking this way, consider what Ismail is pointing out here. If you outsource low value tasks, then you have the opportunity to free up your time and generate additional revenue. For example, if I shoot real estate and I only have time to handle two properties in a day at $500 a shoot, I make $1,000 a day. But if I outsource the editing to someone who's way better than me and can get it done in 20 minutes for 100 bucks, well, it frees up more time for me to shoot a third property, which now brings me to $1,200 a day. So my point here is that if you outsource some of those low value activities that take up your time while you're trying to grow your business and work your day job at the same time, it's ultimately going to allow you to focus on taking on more work and then growing your photography business. So to wrap up this video, I wanted to share a quote that I recently heard from the Robin Hood co-founder Vlad Tenev. I know a lot of people don't like him, but putting that part aside, he said something that really resonated with me. Everything around you, the world that exists, is built by people, a lot of whom aren't much smarter than you or more capable. And a big step is just deciding you're going to do it. You're going to try to drive and change something rather than being a passive participant in the world. So no matter where you are in the world or what your circumstances happen to be, I hope that this video encouraged you to take action and change something as well. So if you found this helpful, don't forget to subscribe. And speaking of diversification, if you're looking to learn more about photography and how you can scale your business, I do have an online photography school that you can check out. Just head over to speedyphotographer.com. Here I teach you everything from how your camera works to how you can grow your business and land paying clients. All of the training content is based on over 300 pages of scripted material. So there's no fluff, there's no wasted time, there's no talking about what I had for breakfast yesterday. If you have any questions, just let me know and I'll see you in the next video.